We crept up on their fort, and I jumped over the wall first. My fellows jumped after me. Stanley had a fascination with technology, and he loved um, to do things that were unusual. Um, and uh, I think that was one of the ways that he uh, got into his, got into the, the creative side of filmmaking by this attention to detail and technical detail in particular. He really is the quintessential auteur. He does pretty much everything. In that sense, it's not, I suppose you might say, the traditional collaborative a way of working. His method was to be in control entirely. It was always possible to discuss, contribute, uh, suggest things. But eventually, the edit uh, was as he would have wished. I initially was engaged as uh, an assistant editor and just uh, archiving the film, essentially, and putting it in scene order, well, Stanley had a um, trailer fitted out as a cutting room. All the cataloging was done there, um, the assembly of dailies, the marking up of scripts, uh, the coding, all those kind of things were done in this rather lush trailer, which had beautiful sort of floor-to-ceiling windows at both ends, wonderful overhead lighting, carpets, soundproofing. It was probably one of the better cutting rooms I'd worked in up until that time. So we used to literally just move that around wherever it was convenient for the location. And I guess uh, I passed some kind of unwritten test or something, and Stanley asked me if I'd stay on and become the editor, which was great, obviously. I could hardly turn something like that down. We started editing when all the principal photography was done, and he had um, a garage right next to his house um, that had been converted to an editing room with steam bags and desks and stuff like that. We worked as a team, as that's the right word, and I wasn't really uh, an equal member of the team, but anyway, it was a very slow process. And we started on scene one, and we just worked through each scene, put them aside, come back to them. And so he would work through every permutation very thoroughly. Because it was this very slow, methodical building, um, we never got to the end of a sequence and then totally recut it. It was worked through as, as we were working on a particular scene. Redmond, would you mind not smoking for a while? The film is quite simple in some ways. There is quite a lot of scenes that are literally just one shot. So there's no choice there at all. That's the way it is, you know. And then there are other scenes, particularly like, for instance, the gambling scene where he meets Lady Lyndon. Uh, yeah, there was a quite considerable amount of cover and all those looks between them and the looks of Murray looking at Barry. and So uh, where there were a lot of choices to be made, where there was a lot of choices in any particular setup and any uh, speech even, we got in two reel-to-reel -reel video recorders and we videoed the entire library of film uh, and then... When, when we came to a scene that had a lot of dialogue, particularly dialogue, um, Stanley would say, OK, edit together all the takes of somebody saying their first line. The same reading over and over and over and over again. And um, decide which one was the best for that line. And then we'd do it again for the next line and the next line and the next line. And as you can imagine, in the end, it became, you know, take one, take ten, take three, take seven, take seven. And you started to put it together, and it becomes immediately obvious that it's not consistent follow-through uh, of the thought process in the actor's head. And so eventually we would then narrow it down to try and reduce the number of different takes, which was uh, his way to choose between any of a multiple uh, number of takes. Because, you know, cutting... Film on Steenbeck's is, is a very laborious. You've got to keep the material that you've gone through and the material that, you've, that you will be coming to all in sync all the time. You didn't have random access, which is what's so wonderful about editing now. In a sense, it's, it's what we have come to understand as digital editing. But the shameful nature of his conduct towards your ladyship Stanley was always very uh, concerned about timing, timing of an edit, 
for instance, he would make me measure quite literally the number of frames between the end and the beginning of what the actor said. And he would try it so sort of long, maybe eight frames after, nine frames after they finished speaking. And then he'd look at that and he'd say, no, that's not good. So how long is the shot, he'd say. So we'd measure the entire shot and then we'd divide it by either three or six and take off that number of frames. So sometimes we would be trimming down two or three frames, but he responded to it in an emotional sense. And so, you know, the math was just part of the machinery, if you like. The dual scene um, towards the end of the film, I think that took something like six weeks of editing, largely because of the way it was deliberately drawn out. I mean, in a sense, it's audacious, you know, to be able to drag it out that long. You already know that he's not going to survive in some way. Mr. Lindon. Will you take your ground? I think it was just a balance, just to get it to that kind of excruciating tension. I mean, you know, that's one of the things people talk about in the film, is this kind of really slow pace. And it was very deliberate, particularly if you bear in mind the films that were being released around about that time. It was totally against the current thinking which would have been speed, fast, snappy. Yes. Uh, you know, zooms, when they were used, and they were used quite a lot around that period, were really fast, and or they'd be used as a crash zoom almost. But Stanley just went all the way back and took it back to this uh, sort of tapestry that he would just expand on and expand and expand and expand. I think that he did that as a way of saying, I don't have to do this the way you do it, I'm doing it my way. It's a blessing to see my darling boy has attained a position I always knew was his due. We tried, like the old-fashioned silent movies, um, where there'd be title cards between scenes and things like that, um, but we felt that that slowed the film down just too much and it stopped it, in a sense. Uh, and then we tried uh, narration uh, and gradually worked through uh, different narrators um, and eventually ended up with Michael Horden reading um, the narration. If he had I think it does increase the tension because it gives you a little bit of advanced knowledge and yet you're being forced to wait for it. The striving after this peerage was one of Barry's most unlucky dealings of this time. I think Stanley was very aware of the power of music. Uh, um, I and mean, if you listen to a lot of his films, the music is almost more important than the soundtrack, and he knew just how much that kind of the emotions that music generates helps generate emotion in an audience. And so he would be searching very deeply for you know, a piece of music that he felt would work for the film and add something to it. Stanley had a giant hi-fi system right next to the Steenbecks, and he had this enormous library of music. We'd play music pretty much all day, just listening to music while we were working. And he'd note down anything that he thought would be interesting or relevant in terms of the film. On this six-plate Steenbeck, we had a, a multiple recorder head, uh, which meant that we could bounce dialogue, for instance, or, or sound effects, or uh, music or even a voiceover onto a three-track head and, and so we could do a kind of rough mix uh, of the soundtrack as we were going along. If he wanted to try a piece of music against the film, we'd run the piece of film and I would drop the needle on the deck and we'd listen to the music through the system. When we came to record the music for the British Grenadiers, one thing that happened that was uh, quite amusing, although perhaps not for those involved, uh, was an incident between Stanley and Leonard Rosenman regarding a click track um, that kept in time in order to be able to cut the sequence. The click track was literally a mechanical drum beat, essentially. It's just a click, 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 click. It's not a drum, it's just a mechanical noise. 
because obviously the marching has to be in time with the music and it's got to be consistently all the way through. So when we came to record the music during the post-production, um, the first time that uh, Leonard um, had to conduct, we had to feed him this click track. If you've ever heard a click, click track, particularly if it goes on for a long time, it's really annoying. It's click, 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 and it's a very harsh, sharp noise. And so by the first time uh, they'd recorded the one pass of the drums, uh, Leonard wanted to replace the click track with the first recording of the drums and then use that to record subsequent takes so that the, the layers of drums were built up. And Stanley wouldn't let him because he felt he had to retain the original um, tempo in case there was any kind of variation in the, in the recording of the drums. So he made him listen to the click track, I can't now remember, but probably five or six times. And I think by the end, Leonard had really had enough and he pulled his headphones off and just left the room. And uh, Stanley had to go after him and calm him down. <laughs> When the film was finished, I and several of my fellow technicians used to have to go around the cinemas where it was going to play. And first of all, we had to check the light on the screen, so we had a special meter for checking the light on the screen and whether it was an even spread of light. And then we also had uh, sound meters to check whether the speakers were all playing correctly. Uh, and so, and then once we'd got the f screening room set up, we then ran the entire film just to check it through. I mean, in truth, uh, I saw it too many times at that point to remain with any judgment, you know, of the film itself. It was a fantastic experience, obviously. We worked six, sometimes seven days a week, long hours. And so it was very engaging and it was really took over a large part of my life. And it remains very strong in my memory as an experience that I really enjoyed and also suffered from.